بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This is the seventh section of this large poem This is about the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's ascension <coughs> One of the greatest miracles of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was his night journey from Makkah Mukarramah to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem up to the seven heavens. So he says, Ya khayra man yamma mal'afuna sahatahu sa'yan wa fawqa mutunil aynuqir rusumi wa man huwa al-ayatul kubra li mu'tabirin wa man huwa al-ni'matul uzma li mughtanimi sarayta min haramin laylan ila haramin kama sara al-badru fi dajim min al-zulami وبت ترقى إلى أن نلت منزلة من قاب قوسين لم تدرك ولم ترمي وقدمتك جميع وقدم وقدمتك جميع الأنبياء بها والرسل تقديم مخدوم على خدمي وأنت تخترق السبع الطباق بهم في موكب كنت فيه صاحب العالم حتى إذا لم تدع شأوا لمستبق من الدنو ولا مرقا لمستنم خفضت كل مقام بالإضافة إذ نوديت بالرفع مثل المفرد العلم So he says O oh best of those whose courtyard is sought by the needy They run or ride the backs of tireless camels O oh greatest sign for those who seek to learn O greatest grace for those who seek to gain. You rose by night from sanctuary to sanctuary as the full moon travels through the firmament of dark. And through the night you rose until you gained a stage of two bows length, hitherto never reached or hoped for. There all of the prophets gave you precedence. The messengers too, as servants give way to their master. You broached the seven-tiered skies with them behind you in a possession where you were the standard bearer until your closeness left no space for others on the quest nor summit for others to attain and then he continues so first he starts this off by actually saying ya khayra man yamma al afuna sahatahu which is a form of address to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so it's uh, you can say that this is poetic istighatha that he's doing where he's actually calling out to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in this poetic form but this calling out is actually praise for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it's a figure of speech it's the way it's done so he says oh the one who those who seek good seek virtue you're the one whose courtyard whose yard whose place whose abode where you are interned those people who want good they seek to come. They intend to come to you. That's why anybody who goes to Makkah Mukarramah, I haven't until now heard of anybody who's gone to Makkah Mukarramah and not gone to Medina Munawwara. Generally, we always go to Medina Munawwara as well. And there's a reason we go there, to benefit. Sa'yan wa fawqa mutunil aynukir rusumi. People come walking and running. He puts that before coming on an animal because walking to the Haramain for your Hajj or Umrah and for your Ziyarah is superior to uh, going on an animal or going uh, in some kind of vehicle or another form of transport. وَفَوْقَ مُتُونِ الْأَيْنُكِ rusumi, And also on the backs of Aynuk. Anybody know what Aynuk is? It's a very interesting, it's a plural of Naqatun. Naqatun means a, a she-camel. So Aynuk is a plural of that. Ar-Rusumi. Tireless she-camels. That never tire because that's the way they are. So people come from far and wide. They're coming by walking. They're coming in other, other ways. They come to look for you. So what he says here, then he says, the one who himself is the greatest of signs for those who are looking for signs, who understand signs, who take lessons from signs. And not only is he the sign, but also the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest bounty. And ni'ma al-udma. He is the greatest bounty for the one who seeks bounties. 
for the one who's looking for the best virtue and the best bounty that he could have on this earth, the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest of bounties. سَرَيْتَ مِنْ حَرَمٍ لَيْلًا إِلَىٰ حَرَمٍ You went from one haram, one sanctuary to another sanctuary at night. كَمَا سَرَ الْبَدْرُ فِي دَاجٍ مِّنَ الظُّلَمِ Just like the moon, it goes through dark nights and it illuminates wherever those dark nights as it goes. And then he says, and then you continue to ascend and to rise until you achieved a very high status, a very high maqam, a very high station that was closer than two bows length, which could not be achieved by anybody else, not even hope to be achieved. But you got that stage. <clears throat> All the prophets, they put you forward. All the prophets, they put you forward. Because what happened... When the Prophet ﷺ reached Masjid Laqsa, all the other Prophets had also been made to assemble down there in congregation. So they're in the Masjid. Everybody's standing back. What should we do now? Who's going to lead the prayer? They all know that they have to do some Nafal prayer. But who's going to lead the prayer? So they're all looking around. Who's going to lead the prayer? They're all wondering. You know, there's, you can see there's 10 ulama. They're all wondering who's going to lead the prayer? Who should we put forward? Jibreel ﷺ came and he took Muhammad ﷺ and he put him forward. Though he is the last of the prophets to come and he is the, he is the child of many offspring, great grandchild of many of the prophets. They all put him forward just like servants give way to their master. And then he carries on. So let's just look at these in a bit more detail. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بالحج. He told Ibrahim alayhi salam to announce after Ibrahim alayhi salam made the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ismail alayhi salam after they raised the house Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said you go and make the announcement He said who's going to listen to me? There's not, not many people here He said وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ It's your responsibility to make the announce, announcement and we'll get it to people In those days you could hardly ever fathom words reaching so far away but today it's easy. You say something here and it could be broadcast uh, around the whole world if it gets onto CNN or BBC or something like that. It is quite, I mean, subhanAllah, it makes it so much easier for us to understand these things. Ya'tuka, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَىٰ كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتُونَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجِّ نَعْمِيقٍ They're going to come, they're going to come walking. They're going to come on animals, means of conveyance. They're going to come from every corner of the world. And that's exactly what happens today. So likewise to Medina Munawwara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the same thing. Makkah is like that. For Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to make the announcement. And thus every one of us whose announcement has reached. And that's why we go and we say, Labbaik, oh Allah, I'm here. I've listened to the announcement, I'm here. Subliminally, I got that. Spiritually, somehow, whatever you want to... However you want to describe that, I'm here. And likewise, then we go to Medina Munawwara. And he picks up this point. Where else do you generally hear that mention? He's saying, Ya man sahatahu. You're the best of those who seekers of virtue are going to come to his courtyard. Are going to come to the Masjid al-Nabawi. Are going to come to the Rawda Mubarak. Are going to come to the Riyadh al-Jannah. Are coming, coming to the Blessed Grave to give you salam. سَعْيًا وَفَوْقَ مُتُونِ الْأَيْنُقِ الرُّسُمِ They're going to come walking and they're also going to come on animals. They're going to come on she camels. It's mentioned that generally it's an adab to actually walk the last part. Generally it's an adab to walk the last part into Medina Munawwara. It gets difficult but of course you get to your hotel and then you walk from there. There's no... Abu al-Fadl al-Jawhari, when he came to Medina Munawwara and got close to its houses, in those days it was houses as opposed to hotels, he got off and he, he got off his animal and he started to walk. And then he started to cry. He started to cry and he started to sing poems. وَلَمَّا رَأَيْنَا رَسْمَ مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ لَنَا فُعَادًا لِعِرْفَانِ الرُّسُومِ وَلَا لُبًّا نزلنا على الأكوار نمشي كرامة لمن بان لنا أن نلم به ركبا. There's a number of other poems. Another person who saw Medina Munawwara 
as soon as he started seeing the homes, he got off and he said, رُفِعَ الْحِجَابُ لَنَا فَلَاحٌ لَنَا ضَرْبُ قَمْرٍ تَقْتَعُ دُونَهُ الْأَوْهَامُ وَإِذَا الْمَطِيُّ بَلَغَتْ بِنَا مُحَمَّدًا فَذُهُورٌ هِيَ عَلَى الرِّجَالِ حَرَامُ قَرَّبَتْ بِنَا مِنْ خَيْرٍ مَنْ وَطِئَ الثَّرَى فَلَهَا عَلَيْنَا حُرْمَةٌ وَذِمَامُ He said, we, we can't no longer be on the animals, we need to be on our feet. That's the adab. That's why many of the scholars, they, uh, Imam Malik never rode in Medina Munawwara. He said, I don't want my animal to spoil, put filth in a part where the Prophet ﷺ may have walked. There was another great sheikh of the, uh, of the Naqshbandis. He stayed in Medina Munawwara for 13 days. In the Haram, in the Haramain, in the two places. He stayed for 13 days. And his karama was that he didn't eat anything for those days. Why? Just so that he wouldn't have to, he he wouldn't have to relieve himself. Nobody else can. It's a karamat. I mean, it's somebody who's got that. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives them that ability to do that. Uh, the author himself, in his other poem, he says, "فَتَرَى الرَّقْبَ طَائِرِينَ مِنَ الشَّوْقِ إِلَى طَيْبَةٍ لَهُمْ ضَوْضَاءُ فَكَأَنَّ الزُّوَّارُ مَا مَسَّتِ الْبَأْسَاءُ مِنْهُمْ خُلُقًا وَلَا الضَّرَّاءُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مِنْهَا إِبْتِهَالٌ وَسُؤَلٌ وَدُعَاءٌ وَرَغْبَةٌ وَابْتِغَاءُ وَزَفِيرٌ تَظُنُّ مِنْهُ صُدُورًا صَادِحَاتٌ يَعْتَادَهُنَّ زَقَاءُ وَبُكَاءٌ يُكْرِيهِ بِالْعَيْنِ مَدٌّ وَنَحِيبٌ يَحُثُّهُ إِسْتِعْلَاءُ وَجُسُومٌ كَأَنَّمَا رَحَّضَتْهَا مِنْ عَظِيمِ الْمَهَابَةِ الرَّحْضَاءُ وَوُجُوهٌ كَأَنَّمَا أَلْبَسَتْهَا مِنْ حَيَاءٍ أَلْوَانُهَا الْحَرْبَاءُ وَدُمُوعٌ كَأَنَّمَا أَرْسَلَتْهَا مِنْ جُفُونٍ سَحَابَةٍ وَطْفَاءُ He said they're pouring their tears out like it, they're pouring it from bowls. That's how it is when people reach Medina Munawwara. So, what it is, he is essentially saying that this is about going to visit the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Visiting the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is one of the greatest forms of closeness you can have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is extremely profitable to go there and to be able to say salam to him. And it's something that should be sought after. And it's something that is sought after. I know nowadays, especially those who are in authority there, the religious uh, people there, uh, the, the religious guidance people there supposedly, they, they have a different understanding, which is an exceptional understanding that has never been the majority understanding in the Muslim world of the majority of ulama. They try to make you minimize going there as much as possible. That's why they will constantly be telling you that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu used to just come once when he would come back from a journey or something like that as to say that it's not a big deal it's just like come and say salam once and then go you know like saying you're saying salam to your auntie or something like that just go once and khalas forget it so they don't understand that we've come from very far they don't they, don't, they can't understand they just don't understand when there's somebody who wants to stand there for just two minutes they literally want you there for two seconds because they move you up and if they see you kind of standing there for a bit longer, then they get agitated as though you are doing something wrong. So then they say, move up, move up, move up. And then you're trying to tell them, I'm only here once in so many years. I'd like to spend a bit more time. But they don't understand that. So it's, a, it's one of the greatest things that you can do. When you do that, when you are intending to go and visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then start by making salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, durood sharif, as much as possible. And you also have an intention of making salat in the masjid. And to gain barakah from the rawdah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from his mimbar and from his grave, from the place he used to sit, the place his hands used to touch, the place where his feet used to be. And also the pillars that he used to lean on. All of these things we take barakah from. And that is also the place where Jibreel alayhi salam used to come so frequently. Jibreel alayhi salam used to come so frequently. Likewise, we also want to take barakah from the place where Sahaba once were. 
They used to congregate, they used to sit, they used to cry, they used to weep. They used to be sent for the khidmah of the deen. They used to be taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was the place. There was the Ashabu Sufa, the first students in Islam, dedicated Sahaba. They were there. We want to benefit from that place. That's a place where so many things have happened in history. If there's one place in the world where some of the greatest scholars of the world would have definitely congregated and have come and visited, which is not Baghdad. Baghdad is probably the second city after Medina Munawwara that great scholars would go to and they would pass through because it was such a center point. And that's why Khatib al-Baghdadi, he's written this great uh, Tariq Baghdad, which is in... Uh, numerous volumes and he mentions every scholar that ever came into Baghdad that taught there that lived there that passed through there that studied there uh, that subhanallah it's amazing it's in like 40 50 volumes it's an amazing piece of work but Medina Munawwara how can you compare that how can you compare Baghdad with Medina Munawwara everybody has to come to Medina Munawwara so that's the place you're going I mean can can you see the significance and you've been invited to go there then how can you complain as I was mentioning last time, it's a place where the whole Muslim world would like to be. So you've just come there. So that's the barakah that you see. It's the place where lots of things have happened in history. That place holds a lot of history. You can actually feel it in the air. If you, look, if you feel closely, if you concentrate, you can, actually feel, you can actually feel the history weighing down upon you. That's how this place is. Because that's the place where Jibreel used to be. That's the place where Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and the great Imams of the Muslimin. And that is what we're looking at when we get there. Ziyarah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's qabr is pretty much agreed upon by the majority of ulama. There's just very few people like Ibn Taymiyyah, etc., who uh, disagreed with that. They said you should go there to visit the masjid and not the grave. The grave should not be your intention because that is wrong. And they take that because of a misunderstanding of a particular hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said this, now I'll say the hadith to you, and you try to understand what you think it means. لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد. The Prophet ﷺ said that you should not make a, an organized travel. لا تشد الرحال So you should not tie your animals in a particular way, put reins on them, and to you know, make a preparation to go somewhere, except to three masjids. There's only three masjids where you can actually prepare and organize to go and you'll get something out of that. That is Makkah Mukarramah, Masjid Al-Haram, Masjid Nabawi, and Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now, clearly what this means is, if I live in Clapton, and for some reason I believe that for me to come to this masjid, or to go to Regent's Park, or East London Mosque, or wherever it is, and I'll get more reward for doing that, then I'm wrong. Because you should not do that. You, you won't get any benefit from going specially to any other masajid except three masajid. Right? You won't get any reward for doing that. Your local masjid is where you get the most reward because that's your masjid that has the right over you. That's where you should be praying. Of course, if you've got two close masjids, then you've got a choice. But that's what it means. It's as clear as that. Now, can you say that because of this hadith, it's prohibited for me to go and visit my auntie. I'm not allowed to prepare a journey to go to visit my auntie. Does this hadith even indicate towards that? What about it's, uh, it's prohibited for me to go and do some sightseeing or go and take a visit somewhere, go to another country? Does this hadith in any way indicate towards any of that? So how can you now say that this hadith prohibits visiting the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It's only saying Masjid al-Nabawi. The difference they would say is that Ibrahim alayhi salam is not buried in Makkah Mukarramah. He made the Kaaba. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he made this masjid, dedicated it. That was special, like that. Whether he's there or not, it doesn't make a difference. That's what they would say. We say there's a masjid has a special merit. But then him being there is another thing. That's a greater thing. Because that is who, what makes the masjid so great anyway. So they're two separate things, but they're so interlinked. That's another thing. But the main thing is that the hadith is actually just speaking about... It, it's just informing us that you're not going to get any reward for... Uh, any extra reward for going to any other masjid. 
except these three masjids, 100,000, 10,000 and so on. <coughs> but it doesn't prohibit from going to visit a graveyard. It doesn't prohibit from going to visit your relatives or from visit the Salihin or some pious individual. That's all a different story whatsoever. So how can you say that it's wrong for someone to come with the intention of visiting the Prophet ﷺ's grave? He is, we know he's alive, it's our belief that he's alive. So we've come to say salam to him directly. We've come to benefit from that place. We've come to benefit from standing in front of him and giving him salam. And salam to Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu which the Muslims have been doing for centuries. So that's, that's what it is. So they try to discourage you. They try to discourage you. you. We just have to do it because our connection is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said as related by Anas radiallahu anhu that whoever visits me in Medina Munawwara with the intention, uh, muhtasiban, you know, with reckoning for some reward or some benefit from it, kana fi jiwari, he will be in my protection. وَكُنْتُ لَهُ شَفِيعًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ And I will be intercessor for him on the Day of Judgment. There's a number of other hadith about this as well. Now, how long should you stand there? If you're given the luxury of standing there as much as you want, how long should you stand there? I used to always be concerned. I used to always, <coughs> I used to always wonder about that. Because generally, you feel like you want to stand there as much as possible because you think you know, it's a special place for you to stand there. But then you suddenly lose your concentration and then you're wondering what to do. And then you're trying, you know, you get distracted. You've said what you want to say, you've done your salam, you've done whatever you want to do, and then what? So that's why uh, uh, one of the shiuch that I r read, he said, you stand there as long as you, are, you have attention. Once your attention goes, then move away. Because then it's bad other. It's like I've gone to visit somebody. I've spoken to him, and now I'm kind of just hanging around. It looks a bit awkward. I'm just hanging around. There's no concentration. There's no discussion. It's all done, finished, you know. He's got lots of people to tend to. So let me, if I want to be there, have a lot of concentration. Have concentration half an hour, no problem. But when you finish your concentration, then go. And come back afterwards. Khair. Then he says, وَمَنْ هُوَ الْآيَةُ الْكُبْرَى لِمُعْتَبِرٍ وَمَنْ هُوَ النِّعْمَةُ الْعُذْنَى عُذْمَى لِمُغْتَنِمِ He is the one who is the greatest sign for the one looking for a sign. And the greatest bounty for the one who is looking to benefit. The Prophet ﷺ has been made the greatest sign for the one who thinks and reflects over this. Because the Prophet ﷺ, why? Let's think about it. We could, there's endless topics. The Prophet ﷺ, he produced so many miracles that were clear. So many evidences, so many proofs. So many major events that took place during his time. And that makes it rightful for us or anybody to say that he is the greatest sign himself because so many signs appeared from him. So he becomes the greatest sign. And for example, the splitting of the moon is one. Not just one person saw it, many, many, many people saw it. So it's not something that can be denied so easily. Um, stopping the sun for a while. Uh, raising the, the dead. Giving people who are sick, making them feel better. Make, uh, curing them. Uh, telling you about events of the past. Telling you about the nations of the past. Telling us about what is in the books of the previous people. And also the stories, the real stories of the prophets of the past. Fingers producing water so that the whole army is able to drink from that and is quenched. The, the food that is just enough for two or three people feeding an entire army and still being left over. The trees talking to him, bearing witness that he is the prophet. Responding to his call, tearing the ground and coming over and to bow down in front of him. Subhanallah. That must have been just amazing for somebody to, to see that. For the pillar that he used to use on Friday, for that to start to, uh, to whimper when, he, when the mimbar came and was produced for him. And he stopped leaning on that pillar. So that came, it began to whimper. The stones in his hands, the pebbles, they began to make tasbih. And this was heard by other people. So this wasn't just like an individual khabar al-wahid, many of these. Many of these others knew about it as well. 
the wolf speaking, and so on and so forth. Many, many other things. The wolf spoke. Because a wolf came and uh, took, a, took a sheep, and the person took it back from him and said, you're de- denying me my, my food. And he says, wow, subhanAllah, wolf speaking. He says, that's not amazing. What's amazing is the person who's in the city. This was a shepherd on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. He says, what's really amazing is the person in the city who's going to give you more information of the unseen. So then that person came in uh, because of the wolf speaking to him, subhanAllah. So you've got all of these amazing, the iguana speaking to him, responding to him and saying that, yes, I'm a believer. And the camel prostrating and so on and so forth. The piece of lamb or the piece of uh, meat that was poisoned and it spoke that I am poisoned, don't eat me. And so on and so forth. Numerous things. All the signs that came beforehand, all the signs that were afterwards, all the prophecies of his, makes him the greatest sign. Then the Prophet ﷺ is also the greatest bounty. So one is he's a sign that will tell us which way to go. If we follow him, we're following the right way. That's what the author is trying to emphasize here. That you are following the right way if you follow him because he is the greatest sign. There is no other sign. Why look for any other signs? Go to Rasulullah ﷺ directly. When it comes to being the greatest bounty for anybody who's seeking a bounty, then this cannot be hidden on anybody. Especially the people who have any intellect, they will notice that the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest bounty that they've ever had, that they will ever have. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him as a bounty to the makhluk, to the creation, to the people. And he sent him as the rahmatul lil alameen. He sent him as the mercy for all the words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, he says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ it means to give a bounty. Allah has blessed the believers, has gifted them, has given them by sending them a prophet who teaches them, purifies them, reads the verses to them. Allah is saying that Allah has given you a bounty by sending him. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so the Prophet ﷺ is a source of mercy in that sense. Shaykh Abu Abbas al-Mursi, he says that Al-Anbiya khuliqu min al The whole reason for Anbiya coming is purely merciful. That's what they're sent for. To take the people away from the darknesses to the light. What greater mercy is there? Somebody st- stumbling around in the dark. And suddenly you show them the way here, brother, let me take you. Somebody holds your hands and guides you out and you're like, subhanallah. The problem is we don't even know we're in the darkness. People don't know they're in darkness until they see the, the darkness of the hereafter. They'll notice that then they were in the darkness. We are so blessed that we've been shown the way, subhanallah. You know, to know what's darkness and what's not darkness, there's still a lot more darkness in our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove all of that darkness. And give us the full light through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We only sent you as a source of mercy for all the worlds. Alameen, not just for, uh, not just for insan, but alameen, all the worlds. Just like, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What can you understand from alameen there? All praise is to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. How many worlds is He the Lord of? So as comprehensive that, as that is, the Prophet ﷺ is a mercy for that many worlds. Even if they came before Him. Because when you get deep, you understand that this entire world was created for a very particular reason, which had a big, Prophet ﷺ had a big part to play in there. So He invited people to Allah with basir or with deep insight. Very clear, good proofs, and ease, easy to follow the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentioned the paths to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, these are the ways of huda. And he said, these are the ways of destruction. So, he didn't leave anything, he didn't leave anything that would take a person close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentioned it, he invited towards it, whether specifically or in general. 
and anything that would distract one from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made that, that clear, either specifically or in general. And he did not stop at anything. He never lazed around. He never took a holiday. He never said, let me take off a month, six weeks. We have to do that sometimes. He didn't have to do that. He worked every day, every moment of his time was there for guidance. That's a, that's a real source of mercy where it's full dedication. Full dedication. He put himself into precarious positions, into dangerous situations. And he illuminated the path for us. So the Prophet ﷺ elevated the standard of Islam and he completed his da'wah in this world. He clearly made distinction between the halal and the haram, between the truth and between the falsehood. He opened up the ways for people to think that this is the way you understand these things. This is the way you comprehend. That is why it was the verse in the Quran is so perfect where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is no reason to force anybody into the faith. لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي There is no compulsion in the faith. There doesn't have to be. The truth has been fully made distinct from the wrong, from the evil. The Prophet ﷺ did his job so perfectly that there is no doubt left. There is no doubt left. It's clear. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared that very clearly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. That the way that deen was completed was through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. So anybody who wants to look for benefit, they will find the greatest benefit in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because that is how they will succeed both in this world because when you start following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you'll get barakah in your life. You'll be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll have sukoon. You may have calamities, but you'll know how to deal with them. You will not be depressed. Because as I said, depression is the opposite of tawakkul. You'll have tawakkul. You'll know what you're doing. So you will be totally at comfort and at peace because you're following Rasulullah And the closer you are, the more comfortable that you will be. And then in the hereafter, of course, there is endless bliss. So now it's clearly when the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest sign, he's also the greatest benefit then it ties in with the previous poem. That is why those who seek virtue, they go and they come from far and wide, walking and on different means of conveyance, they come to his courtyard. Because there is so much to be had from there. Sarayta min haramin laylan ila haramin kama sar al badru fi dajim min al And now he. After introducing this section, he starts talking about the purpose of this section, which is the Mi'raj. So we'll just look at this first point here. He says, um, Sarayta means going from at night time, traveling by night. Haram to Haram, obviously referring to Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa. People are quite confused about why is Masjid al Haram, because generally we, our understanding of Haram is something prohibited. Why do they call Masjid Haram? A lot of people have this, but they, I've noticed few people ask me the question, but they kind of turned it around a bit, because it does sound a bit silly to say, because they know, it, it can't mean that. It says, no, haram here doesn't mean prohibited in the sense of haram, unlawful. It means haram in the sense that it's wrong to do so, it's a protected environment. It's a sanctified, honorable environment where you can't do certain things. So in that sense, it's a haram. So it's a haram, that's what we call it. And why is Masjid al-Aqsa called Masjid al-Aqsa? Because in those days, the furthest masjid was in Jerusalem. So it was already existent. It was already present. And because it was the furthest masjid, Aqsa means distant, furthest, at the edge. That's why it's called like that. That's why one day, this person who was interested in Islam had been coming to the masjid quite a bit. He says, you guys are always speaking about Masjid al-Aqsa and saying it's in the Quran. I've read the whole Quran and I've never found it in the Quran. So I was like, I said, no, it's there. Subhanalladhi asra bi'abdihi layla min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. He says, no, no, I've looked everywhere. It's not there. I said, hold on. Then I kind of 
figured out that he's reading a translation. I said, where, where are you reading? He brought Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation. In there it says, Glorified be he who took his servant by night from the sanctified abode to the furthest abode. So he's done a literal translation. So that's why he got confused. Some Orientalists, though they may really study their subjects well, they make certain uh, strange mistakes like this. Uh, one of the other mistakes I just read in an article I was reading by one of the Orientalists about what, is, what was the madhab of Ibn Sina, whether he was an Ismaili or a Hanafi. So he says, um, the Hanafis, they, find it, they, they say it's fine to drink wine. I said, that's not right. But then I figured out what they're saying. He says the other three schools don't, but the Hanafis do. So he was trying to prove by that that Ibn Sina is a Hanafi because he also considered that to be correct. But basically, you know where he's getting wine from? From Nabiv. Nabiv. Nabiv is uh, put dates into water for about 12 hours, something like that. And then it sweetens the water. In, that, in those days, the water wasn't very pleasant everywhere. So, you know, you had some water which was not very pleasant source. So to make it a bit more pleasant, you'd leave some dates in there for a while. The dates would soften out, the flavor, the sweetness from there would go into the water and drink it. So now, according to the other three madhabs, they don't allow it once it's changed a bit. Whereas the Hanafis still allow it until it doesn't froth up and become intoxicated. So the Hanafis allow it to a, a greater limit. They have some hadith for that. He calls that wine. It's not wine, it's not intoxication. But they just kind of like randomly just say it's wine. So there are certain things like that that you have to be careful about. And because it's an authoritative article about that. So it's kind of very misleading. So Masjid al-Aqsa is, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was taken there. He was taken to all three masjids. Masjid al-Haram, Masjid Nabawi, which was his own designation. And he was also taken to Masjid al-Aqsa. Prophet ﷺ didn't really travel much around the world. He went into Sham, but then he was taken to Masjid al-Aqsa on this special occasion. And then he also mentions during the trip, uh, during this migration, uh, during this uh, ascension trip, that he was also taken to Baytul Laham, Bethlehem, and a number of other places, um, according to some of the narrations. Anyway, he went to the Baytul Maqdis, which is one of the three of our great masajid. The Prophet ﷺ said, I said, لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد مسجدي هذا, this masjid of mine, masjid al-haram, and the Masjid of Eliya. Eliya is the name of Jerusalem. That's Masjid Eliya. Now, just then he says, "Kama sar al badru fi min al Just like the full moon, it goes through the darkness of the night and it illuminates. Likewise, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is illuminating in the darkness of this dunya and the corruption, and the problems and the shirk of this world. But of course, his guidance is greater than the moon's guidance. But because that's one thing that we can where we can see darkness and we can see the light of the moon so that has been used as an example or as a metaphor even though of course it's not as great as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there was a desert Arab his camel he couldn't find it in the darkness it was so dark he couldn't find his camel now he's, he thinks he's gonna die he doesn't know where to go what to do until he eventually lost hope completely he thought forget it I'm, I'm finished now Maybe he didn't have any water with him or any sustenance or whatever it was. He f eventually gave up and felt, I'm going to finish, I'm dying now. Suddenly the moon came out. Now can you imagine how much he thanked the moon then? When you've given up all hope and then suddenly somebody brings a light. Allahu Akbar. So then he said the following poem. A poem Mada aqulu wa qawli fi kathu hadarin wa qad kafaytani tafsila wal jumala إن قلت لا زلت مرفوعا فأنت كذا أو قلت زانك ربي فهو قد فعل. So he he says, how do I praise you now? How do I praise you, O Moon? If I say to you that oh you are very elevated, well that's how you are. And if I say that my Lord has adorned you, well then that's exactly what he's done. So what should I say to praise you beyond that? He got very happy. So this is likewise when we get happy that the Prophet has shown us the way, then subhanAllah, then there's going to be poetry about him. What this is speaking about is speaking about Rasulullah that he was taken from night 
at, by night. One day he was sleeping in Masjid al-Haram. This is before the migration. This was also just after the 10th year of Hijrah. This took place in the last three years that, that the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca. For 13 years he was in Mecca. So this took place in one of those three years before going to Medina Munawwara. There was the, the 10th year was considered to be the year of two sorrows, two griefs, because he lost two very important uh, supporting people. He lost Khadija radiallahu anha. She passed away, so that was his internal support. And outside, he lost Abu Talib, his uncle. Am al Huznain. That's what it's called, the 10th year. Then this happened where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala great gave him this great gift and he was taken up to the heavens. So he was lying there in either Umm Muhanit's house or he was in the Masjid al-Haram. The angels came and said, let's take him. And he went with them by body. Physically, he went there. He went with them and they took him on a buraq to Jerusalem first. And that's where he met the other prophets. He led them in, in prayer. And that after that, he was taken up to the heavens. Heaven by heaven, he went up. And each one is protected. Each one has an angel protecting him. When he, Jibreel alayhi salam, when he got there, the angel of that heaven would ask, who's here? Said, this is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Jibreel with Muhammad sallallahu Has he been invited? Subhanallah. He's been invited. That's one way to read that. The, because generally you read it as a question. Has he been invited? But the other way to read it, as some of the ulama have read it, is, oh, he's been invited. Like an exclamation. Oh, wonderful. In fact, some of the ulama actually mentioned that one of the reasons the Prophet ﷺ was taken up to the heavens is that the people of the dunya were benefiting from him. But he's supposed to be a mercy for everyone, for the alam of the malaika and the angels as well. So he's taken up there so that he can also benefit them as well. So he got there unto the first heaven. When he got to the first heaven, there as it was opened for him, there was Adam alayhi salam there. So Adam alayhi salam is on the first heaven. This is mentioned in the hadith of Muslim. Is that Adam alayhi salam is on the first heaven. He welcomed him. Oh my great son, my great son. Welcome, welcome. And then after that they carried on to the second one, Jibreel alayhi salam. Same kind of questioning, exclamation, uh, surprise. And there he met Isa alayhi salam and Yahya, uh, Zakari, uh, Zakari, Yahya alayhi salam. Two cousins. So Yahya alayhi salam, obviously he's passed away, but somehow he's represented there. His ruh is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to put anybody wherever they want. But Isa alayhi salam is obviously alive still. He's not died a mortal death. And then he went up to the uh, third heaven. And there he was met by Yusuf alayhi salam. And then on, on and on, the fourth one, he met Idris alayhi salam. And so on, on to the fifth one where he met Harun alayhi salam, on to the sixth one where he met Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam took a special interest in him because he knew something special is happening. Musa alayhi salam always wanted to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi always wanted to see Allah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran where Musa alayhi salam said, I want to see you, arini, anzur, ilayk, show me yourself, I'd like to see you. Qala lan tarani, you're not going to be able to see me. Insisted and then he said, okay, look at that mountain. So he's always wanted to see him. If you always wanted to see somebody, but you haven't, you haven't met them. And then suddenly somebody comes and they've met that person. Somebody's come from the haram or whatever it is. You're going to sit there and grill them about it. Tell me about it. What is, is it like this? Is it like that? Is it like this? So they say that one of the reasons why Musa Islam kept sending him back and forth to decrease the 50 prayers when he, was, when he came back after meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so that he can keep meeting him and seeing him and talking to him. Wallahu alam. That's just somebody's analysis. It's not mentioned in the hadith necessarily. So then the seventh heaven, that is where Ibrahim alayhi salam is. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the second greatest prophet after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he went beyond that to the extent after which even the angels could not go. That's why Jibreel alayhi salam eventually told him, I can't go beyond this place. You'll have to go alone. This is at the end of the universe. Jibreel alayhi salam has no access there. And that was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi went there. And he was alone. That's emptiness. Whatever that is, that's a very ajeeb place. But they say that there's a narration which mentions that he heard Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu's voice there. 
So why does he hear his voice there? Because in that place it's so strange. He's feeling so alone. So he is made to hear somebody familiar to him. And then he visits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How exactly Allah knows best. But the Prophet has gone beyond without a spacesuit, beyond where any any mobile of today can get to, any shuttle today. Without a spacesuit, without any protection, just like that. That means there's a possibility. That means there's a possibility. It's not intrinsically impossible for that to happen. And one day it might happen again. Not there, but somewhere close or beyond. And clearly we're going to go up because Jannah, Jannah is on the seventh heaven. Anyway, he got 50 prayers as the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. He came back, Musa alayhi salam, kept sending him back until it went, eventually was made to five. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ما يبدل القول لدي What I said stands. You are, you, you, I want you guys to have 50 prayers. But that's fine now. You do five, multiply it by ten, you'll get the reward of 50. And that was just a way to... It's all psychological because it was... We should have been doing 50. Has anybody ever distributed day in 50? See how often you'd have to do it. 24 hours. It's more than two. That would be more than two an hour. It'd be more than... Because you had 24 hour, 25 hours. Then you'd have to do two an hour to get 50. So 24 hours, you'd have to do a bit more than two an hour. Right? That, that would be quite interesting. But alhamdulillah, may Allah reward Musa alayhi salam. I'm sure he's waiting for some dua there, but his ummah will thank me. Because he said, I've tried people, but they, they haven't worked, and there's nobody's going to be able to do that much. They can't do three, so. But yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'll give you the reward of five. No problem. I'll give you the reward of five. And that's exactly what happened. And Musa alayhi salam wanted him to go even more, to lessen it more. But then he said, no, I'm... I can't, I'm embarrassed now to go anymore. Then he came back and people started questioning him. And the fact that people started questioning him proves that his claim was that I went in body. Because if he had gone in dream and he told people that, why would anybody have a problem with that? People go further than, you know, people go all over the place in their dream. Nobody has any questions about that. Oh, he just dreamed it. Everybody accepts that. Even if you don't see dreams yourself, you can accept that somebody else could have seen such a dream. But the fact that they had an issue, made a big deal about it, and they started going and telling the people who had become Muslim, do you believe that your Prophet, if he tells you this, and so on? And then they came and interrogated him. And he mentions that they came and this group had just come from Jerusalem. So then they started uh, asking him how many windows, how many floors, how many this, how many that. And he said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. When I went there, it was just like so fast that I didn't really think about this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then lifted up a kind of an image for it in front of me. And I started just counting and giving them the response. So that all proves that it was done physically. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand the great gift that we've been given of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and may he, may, uh, may he allow us to benefit from him as a gift. That's the main thing. We can acknowledge it. But then the other thing is that we benefit from the gift. Somebody gives you a gift. You know he's given you a gift. But you just sit there and it's gathering dust. So what's the point of that? The point is that we benefit from it. And we can benefit from it. There's no end to it. The Prophet ﷺ has so much to offer. We can never exhaust that possibility. So we can take as much as possible. There's enough room for for all of us to go and get as much as possible. Allahumma anta salamu inka salam tabarak diyad al jalali wal ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Allahumma ya hannanu ya mannan. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al zalimin. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Oh Allah, accept our du'as. O oh Allah, make the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the guide that we adopt. O oh Allah, make him the guide that we adopt. O oh Allah, grant us the ability to follow him. Make, allow us to follow the light. Allow that light to become visible for us and to become clear for us. 
Oh Allah, we've, also, we've already taken you as our Lord and our Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as our messenger and Islam as our deen. Oh Allah, we ask that you give us space among those who are close to you, among your awliya, among those who you have special protection for. Oh Allah, we ask that you grant us love in our hearts for all things which are of obedience to you. Make those things beloved in our hearts so that we want to do them. And all those things which are disobedience, O oh Allah, make them hated in our hearts. Make them hated in our hearts. O oh Allah, have mercy on us. O oh Allah, have mercy on us. O oh Allah, have mercy on us and don't deprive us. Don't deprive of us uh, of, the, of your gaze of mercy, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, we ask that you treat us with compassion, with softness. O oh Allah, O oh Allah. You even told Musa alayhi salam to go and speak to Pharaoh with softness. That's what you told Musa salam and Harun salam. Oh Allah, you said that about somebody who used to say, Ana rabbukum al -a'la. I am your highest Lord. Oh Allah, we are those who say, Subhana Rabbi al -a'la. Oh Allah, we ask you treat us with softness as well. Oh Allah, we're more rightful to be treated with softness than Pharaoh was. You told Musa salam to treat him with softness. So oh Allah, we can hope for softness from you. Oh Allah, we ask that you treat us with gentleness and with softness and forgiveness of oh Allah that you grant us in our, in our time of need our time of need is for your forgiveness O oh Allah we are fuqara and you are the ghani you are the enriched ones we ask that you open up our hearts and you grant us your barakah and your rahmah and your mercy and allow your kalima to be infused and your dhikr and remembrance to be infused in every part of our body and for your remembrance to emanate from us at all times, whether we're standing, sitting. Our hearts to be constantly connected and associated with you. Oh Allah, this is our lifelong goal. Oh Allah, make this our goal. So that we have the kalima, we die being satisfied with you. And when we stand in front of you, we're satisfied with you. And you're satisfied with us. Oh Allah, when we stand in front of the Kaaba, we have so much satisfaction. Oh Allah, give us that same satisfaction. When we stand in front of you and make that a thing that we're going to look forward to. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, send your abundant blessings on our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and grant him a suitable reward on behalf of the entire ummah for all that he has done. O oh Allah, only know, you know how much he has provided for us, how much he has illuminated for us. O oh Allah, we can't fathom what we would like to benefit and we'd like to ask you to send him as many blessings as possible. Grant us his company in the hereafter. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu.